Hello, my name is Marcus. I'm the compiler of a collection of therapy quotes entitled Psychoanalytic Self-Awareness Quotes. This is TQ 940 to 946. Therapy quote number 940. For Klein, the infant makes a substantial leap during the second quarter of the first year and becomes able to interject the complete object i.e. from breast mother to mother. The good or loved and bad or hated aspects of the mother are now brought together, resolving the schizoid aspects of the ego, but for the first time introducing both the idea of potential loss and feelings of guilt because the infant's hate would then be felt to be directed against the loved object. This ushers in the depressive position. This position serves to strengthen and integrate the ego because it makes for an increased understanding of psychic reality and better perception of the external world. The feelings of loss and guilt result in a drive to make reparation to the object and prepare the way for more satisfactory future object relations. This quote is a reference to Melanie Klein's theory about, she has a theory called um, the two positions. So her theory is that uh, basically in the, in the first position, from birth to six months, uh, the theory is the baby needs to use a defense mechanism called splitting, where the child creates two images of his mother and then denies one of them because it's too painful to accept the idea that the mother is frustrating or unavailable and the baby even thinks that this image of the mother is being frustrating that that is not her mother so he's in denial of this so this is the schizoidal aspect that the baby uh, temporarily engages in in the first few months so again uh, the, the baby in the womb uh, is at one with everything around him he's fused with his environment is in his womb he's fused with mother and he thinks it's just him really and everything is about him and he has a need and his needs get met he doesn't really have a sense of himself as being separate from this otherness it's just all one there it's a fused stage of kind of symbiosis or a stage of fusion and then because humans come out of the womb too early well, this continues but after birth the child gets a the experience that sometimes this otherness, this mother, this womb life, is frustrating. The child can't tolerate that. Huge anxiety. Klein calls that persecutory anxiety, and sometimes she calls it annihilation anxiety because of the baby's small size and how helpless he is and how dependent he is and how weak he is. If the mother's not available, the child is extremely frightened. Um, so to deal with this frightening feelings, this huge anxiety, the baby creates an image of the mother as being unsatisfying and then thinks it's not her. That's the splitting defense. Right? So the baby creates two images of his mother, the satisfying mother and the frustrating mother, but then denies that this frustrating mother is, is the mother. The baby thinks it's another person maybe. So there's a huge distortion of reality there, but this is temporary. So this is the schizoidal aspect that Klein talks about in the first six months. Right. So, so all defense mechanisms are used to deal with anxiety. So the baby feels immense anxiety um, when the mother's not available in the beginning. Baby can't protest, the baby can't do much. How, how does he deal with the, the feelings of being possibly abandoned or, or whatnot? So that's, that's the idea of splitting. Because if the baby thinks that there's two people and he's relating only to the mother and he's going to deny um, that when he's frightened that that's his mother, uh, he, that's how the theory is, that's how he manages his anxiety. It's a distortion of reality. The mother is the same person who's both loving and frustrating, but the baby can't handle that idea. Later on, he can, and the splits come together. But in the beginning, uh, that's the theory about the defense mechanism of splitting. Um, okay. Um, 
Now let's say there's arrested development there at that stage where the splits don't get a chance to come together. That means the baby is still stuck with these unconscious fantasy images of the mother as being either a goddess or, or a frightening creature. The idea about that is that the baby, it's called primary process thinking, the baby just thinks in images. So the theory is all of his memories condense, coalesce, and they become a fantasized personification. Those memories become a, fantas a fantasized personification or an imago, like an image. Um, uh, and uh, the jargon for that is that it becomes a part representation or an internal object. So there's a part representation of the mother as being satisfying. So that's a grand, divine, beautiful goddess figure in a myth or fairy tale. And uh, when the mother is um, unsatisfying, that's a frightening creature. So the baby has these exact, the theory is the baby has these exaggerated images because of his small size. The mother, from the baby's point of view, is a giantess in the nursery. If the giantess is uh, unavailable, he's terribly frightened. So he thinks uh, that this monster is uh, abandoning him. Now he, the baby's own feelings gets fused with this image of the, of the frustrating mother. And this image uh, changes in accordance to the baby's angry feelings about this. So that makes the image even more frightening. That's the theory about that. So the idea about myths and fairy tales, they're meant to describe the inner world of uh, the rest of development. Because the main... Uh, psychological pattern um, that's expressed in fairy tales and motifs, uh, in fairy tales and myths, are the fairy tale and mythological motif of the psychological defense mechanism of splitting. Because in every, in most or all fairy tales and myths, you have some goddess, uh, helpful fairy godmother, a wonderful, supportive, helpful creature. Then you have the opposite. Right. So that represents, the opposite represents the, the baby's anger towards the frustrating mother or the baby's anger to, to the times when the mother was frustrating. Okay. And, the, and the satisfying images, Imagos represents the baby's loved feelings of when the mother uh, was, was loving towards the child. Right. So these images uh, can be uh, expressed in myths and fairy tales. That's the defense mechanism of splitting, good God, bad God, and so on. Um, now, if the baby is very frightened with the mother, if the mother is more frustrating than loving, then the baby has to keep on using that defense mechanism. He never gets a chance to stop using it if the mother is so frightening. But if the mother is more loving than frustrating, uh, the baby feels less of a need to, to use this defense mechanism, then what happens is the split images come together, they meld, and then a new third image arises that's, that represents that the mother is one person who's loving and sometimes frustrating. So it's realistic. So that's what he says here, that, uh, okay, um, in this, during this time, there's an increased understanding of psychic reality so he's not in denial of the mother being frustrating. He can accept that the mother's sometimes frustrating now. Okay? And now there's better perception of the external world. Okay? So because we, we see the external world based on our projections from the internal world. So if the internal world is, is more realistic, then we see the external world more realistically. Huh? Um, so that's uh, uh, videos, uh, quotes, TQ904 to nine, roughly till present, covered the internal object relations world about that. Okay, so in a nutshell, uh, the baby creates two images of his mother in his unconscious. Okay, uh, so goddess or demon, basically, right? Um, that's unrealistic. The mother's not like that. The mother's a human being. Okay. Uh, when the loving memories outweigh the frustrating memories, um, the, the baby starts to recognize his mother as a, a human being, a person, and he comes to respect his mother as a person in her own right. And he feels that he can respect himself as a person in his own right. So, so now there's a mutuality there. There's a sense of mother being separate uh, psychologically from the child. So the child has a sense of self, 
So that's called the stage of differentiation. So when the loving memories outweigh the frustrating memories during the first six months, at the age of six months roughly, the child is able to differentiate. That's a huge accomplishment when the child can differentiate. When he differentiates, he knows himself. Love and gratitude have entered the psychological picture. We say that because he needs the love to differentiate. So if he does differentiate, we assume he got enough love to do that. So we say the love and gratitude have entered the psychological picture. If he's too frightened, he can't differentiate. His main emotions are hate, greed, envy, spite, schadenfreude, vindictiveness, and so on. He's too angry there if he didn't get enough love to leave the symbiotic orbit. Um, the psyche seeks wholeness, but to do that he has to separate out of the fusion from the mother. Each person is, is a person has their own psychological uh, self and their own spiritual self, but they have to differentiate psychologically from the mother to, to find their psychological self, their spiritual self. Um, okay, again, so the jargon is, from birth to six months, this is called the paranoid schizoid position. Emphasis on the word position. So Klein calls this the paranoid schizoid position. Again, the schizoidal aspect of it means it's hugely unrealistic. It's, it's uh, hugely, it's, it's not real that the mother's a goddess or a demon. The mother's a human being. So it's schizoidal-ish, like. Right? And then the paranoid aspect of it is that um, if there's a rest of development, and the splitting defense mechanism is frozen there. If the psychic structure is, if the psychic structure uh, is frozen there, in later life, uh, the person uh, can or may project. Okay, the image of the mother as being frightening onto non-threatening substitute others, or the world, or onto, onto places, or onto the workplace, or their environment. Whatever. Outwardly, they they project that outwardly. Okay. Now they think. This non-threatening substitute other is so frightening. Now they're then okay, so that's paranoid-ish like she means, because it's not true. Right? The non-threatening substitute other is is a, a non-threatening substitute other. That's why they're projecting it onto them. Right? But the psyche does things like that for the person to see that he's still using the defense mechanism of splitting. Anyways, so this is called the paranoid schizoid position from birth uh, to six months. Um, Fair Barron says that if that's there, they may use what's called, what he calls the paranoid technique. Now, another jargon, the, te the paranoid technique is to project the frustrating image of the, fr uh, the image of the frustrating mother onto non-threatening substitute others. Think that others are so bad uh, because that's how the baby felt, um, but he couldn't experience it and feel it when he was a baby. Now, to master that trauma, he's trying to get in touch with that, so he's going to project it outward. So that's, the, that's called a secondary delusion. It's distorting external reality. Right? So, parents, so Fair Baron calls that the paranoid technique. Um, okay, so, and another complication about the paranoid, uh, about the paranoid, uh, the schizoid position, paranoid schizoid position. If there is a rest of development during this phase, um, Several patterns can come out of it. One is the narcissistic pattern. The theory about that is that uh, the child interprets not getting enough love as being devalued, humiliated, shamed, objectified, exploited, used. To deal with the pain of that, the theory is the child uses a defense mechanism. Again, all defense mechanisms are used to deal with, are used to deal with anxiety. The child feels immense anxiety over this. So he may use what's called identification with the aggressor defense mechanism meaning the child just adopts his mother's thoughts to become his own thoughts. Okay, that's the narcissistic pattern. He's fused with the mother, he becomes the mother. He grows up and then does to others, puts others down to communicate that when he was a baby, his mother put him down. Right? And he spends his whole life devaluing others and using sarcastic, uh, put-down humor and, um, and uh, thinks negatively towards others. Right? Um, he's doing that in the, because he's identified with the aggressor. So mother used the child, child identifies with the aggressor, grows up and then uses others, exploits others. Right? They don't have love and gratitude towards others or they don't feel guilt or like they don't have, because they're caught in the repetition compulsion of the trauma of where the mother was so impinging and so engulfing on the child to the point where the child gave up and identified with the aggressor. And he becomes like the mother and then does to others what his mother did to him 
And he's like Sisyphus, he's going to keep on doing it, unless he becomes aware of it. Before he becomes aware of it, he's going to keep on doing to others what his mother did to him, to communicate that when he was a baby, that his mother did those things to him. And he's going to keep on doing it the whole life. That's the narcissistic pattern. Another pattern uh, during this uh, rest of development in the first six months is uh, the closet narcissistic pattern. This person um, um, uh, attaches uh, with others who, you, who has the narcissistic pattern and they vicariously uh, enjoy what the narcissistic pattern is doing. So they're basking in their uh, hate or something, in their glow or so, something like that. So they're getting vicarious identification if their partner is engaged as the narcissistic pattern. Another pattern is the, uh, the hostile provocative attachment style. Uh, the theory about that is that um, from birth to six months, the state, that's called the stage of symbiosis. If the baby was prematurely ejected out of the stage of symbiosis, okay, that means he didn't get his symbiotic needs met. Now he's angry. So that can lead to, that's why he may be hostile and provocative towards others to say that when he was a baby, uh, he didn't get his symbiotic needs met and he's in a kind of panic and he's aggressively trying to, uh, it's as if he wants someone else to fuse with him or her uh, so he can continue to get his symbiotic needs met because the baby needs enough love to differentiate, to lead the symbiotic orbit with the mother. The person using the hostile provocative attachment style didn't get enough love to leave the mother. The baby needs enough love to leave her psychologically. Okay, so the person using the hostile provocative style um, didn't get enough love to leave the mother, so they're angry and they're going to be hostile and provocative and trying to coax, create someone else. The model, the, the prototype for this behavior is the baby being frantic, trying to get mother to fuse with them to meet their needs, and they're stuck there. Another uh, pattern from this, someone called um, hiding behind power struggles as a character defense. Okay, so they're always arguing with others, uh, and that's the only way they can to, to not feel the pain of the conflict with the mother. So the baby and the mother, there was a power struggle over the breastfeeding, and there was, the baby was never satisfied with the feeding experience. Maybe the bottle was used, the schedule was used, it was always misattuned to the baby's needs, so the baby was in battle with this. So that's painful for the baby. So how he's... Avoiding this pain is through the repetition compulsion of repeating the power struggle with others right, to try to master that. So again, all of these patterns, another pattern is uh, the schizoid pattern that resembles the Iago character from literature. Now that one, in the narcissistic pattern, um, because they didn't get enough love, uh, they're going to be uh, greedy, so they want to possess things and own things. Okay, um, so the theory about that is that um, the baby's understanding of what he needs from his mother is an inexhaustible flow of goodness. The baby never got satiated, he never got that goodness. He can never internalize enough love to leave the, mo to leave the mother. So in the repetition compulsion, the narcissistic pattern thinks, well, it's better to possess now, not to own, uh, not to just receive, but to possess it. So now he wants to own material things that are symbolic of mother anything that's good basically money material something that's good if, if he th he thinks he thinks that if he owns it maybe he's mastering the trauma of not receiving enough love it doesn't work of course no one in the present can offer what that person needed as a baby but that's the repetition compulsion uh, he's trying to master that open wound um, so uh, in his in his uh, greed Klein calls that introjective destructiveness because like Sisyphus, he's going to keep on wanting to possess and own, possess and own. He's never satiated. He's never happy. It can't be done. It's almost as if he thinks he might want to travel back in a time machine to undo what happened, but it can't be done. So he's going to keep on being greedy. And then um, if he sees something that represents goodness or something that came about because of goodness, he'll be envious of that. Envy means hatred of the good because... Um, he doesn't want to be reminded of not getting enough love. So if he sees the goodness spoiled, uh, he feels it's not good. So he's, he's not reminded of not getting enough love. So if he feels the goodness damaged or spoiled, he feels gleeful. That's the stress relief. 
So greed and envy there often, sometimes it's just called Grenvy. If you question him about all this, uh, he'll be vindictive and spiteful because his identity he doesn't know doesn't know himself. He doesn't have ontological security, sense of self. He's identified with the aggressor. And uh, now the, the schizoid pattern, the, the severe emotional detachment. Apparently, he doesn't even bother with the greed. He only has the envy and spite and vindictiveness. So he's so the in literature, this is the character that would behind the scenes spread rumors and got others against themselves, and he was gleeful in seeing others hurt themselves. So because he saw everything from the point of view of envy, so he wanted to see what what was around him being spoiled and damaged. And he used rationalizations, of course. All of these things are covered over with rationalizations and lies, right? Because no one wants to face the truth of what's underneath their defense mechanisms. So to cover that, they use rationalizations, false logic, and that kind of thing. Um, okay, so that's a huge... Uh, so again, this is, as Robert Bly says, 30% of what you're going to hear is wrong. It's up to you to figure out which 30%. So that's called the paranoid schizoid position. The main emotions are hate, greed, envy, spite, vindictiveness, schadenfreude. Uh, in the case of the Iago character, Glass says that's the emotional sadism, because that's more intense. He, he wanted to convey the more intensity of it. Um, with the narcissistic pattern, I think we're just saying, I think we're just going to use the schadenfreude there. So there's different degrees of that. Um, okay, so again, the splitting defense mechanism is still being used. That means the child didn't get enough love to, to see the mother as a whole person. If he, the child doesn't see the mother as a whole person, he can't separate from her. If he's too frightened, he can't leave the symbiotic fusion with her. The child needs to feel safe enough to leave her. If he's too frightened, he can't leave her. Fairbairn says the more frustrating the mother is, the more the baby needs the mother, the more the baby clings to the mother, even to the point where he becomes her. That's the narcissistic pattern. Right. So this paranoid schizoid position, or an abbreviation of it, would be the use of the splitting defense mechanism. Rinsley says splitting precludes differentiation. It precludes whole object relating, because the baby's just relating to the breast, you see, it's part object relating. He doesn't achieve whole object relations. Splitting precludes the psychological birth, ontological security, a sense of self, basic trust, Splitting precludes access to the real self and the capacities of the real self. And one of the capacities of the real self is that it allows the person a wide range of affect. So if the person needs to mourn losses, the real self will allow the person to mourn the loss. Splitting precludes that. Splitting doesn't allow a person to mourn because he doesn't have the because he doesn't have access to the real self. Splitting precludes or prevents access to the real self. Right. To get to the real self, he needs the psychological birth. Splitting precludes access to the psychological birth. To get to the psychological birth, the person has to differentiate out of the mother's. Okay, So a lack of differentiation precludes the psychological birth. Splitting precludes differentiation. So as an abbreviation, as a shortcut, we might say, splitting, Rinsley says, splitting precludes mourning. If a person doesn't mourn losses, that's complicated grief, aggravated grief, prolonged grief, uh, delayed onset of grief, chronic sorrow, that can lead to burnout, soul loss, uh, sometimes a nervous breakdown, stress on stress, symptoms of PTSD, and it can lead to, as one person said, to becoming a curmudgeon late in life, not an elder. So the curmudgeon is miserly, stingy, petty, uh, he's still battling with the mother, he's, he's stuck there or he's become the mother, and he's battling with the mother while being the mother at the same time. He couldn't leave the mother. So there's a lot of stress with that. Right. So uh, one quote in this series said that, uh, one author said that he spends his whole time just trying to heal the splits, just trying to face the unconscious ambivalence. The person has an unconscious ambivalence, but he's not aware of it because he's denied the image of the mother's being frustrating. If something's frustrating, he thinks it's not his mother. He thinks it's something else which he projects onto others in the external. Okay, So he says uh, healing is facing the unconscious ambivalence to the mother. 
the idea that when they were a baby, the mother was more frustrating, more misattuned than satisfying. It's not to blame the mother, just trying to understand the psychic structure here. The mother may have had prenatal distress syndrome. The mother may have had birth trauma. The mother may have had intergenerational trauma. The mother may acquire had an, uh, an insecure attachment style herself. The mother may have been psychologically incomplete, meaning she didn't achieve a psychological birth. She may have had trauma while getting her tonsils out at the dentist's office. There could have been school shock, forced relocation, other trauma. So the parents were caught in their existential dilemma. Okay. Um, so that, uh, that's the reality there. That helps us to understand uh, ourselves. So we forgive the other. We understand that. We forgive. Right? Um, and then when we recognize uh, the idea of an insecure attachment style, and uh, we can use Fairbairn's model of the endopsychic structure, the six imagos within, the, the, the image of the mother's being satisfying, linked to a self-representation as being satisfied, image of the other as being enticing, linked to a self-representation as being enticed, an image of the other as being rejecting, linked to a self-representation of being unloved and rejected. So there's these six characters there, that's the endopsychic structure, and the unconscious ego uh, is going to project these six characters, flip them around, project one or all or none, or change it around. Okay, so... Um, So the, the unconscious ego, uh, our own ego, Fairbairn has this thing called splitting of the ego. Our conscious ego deals with the external world. Our unconscious ego uh, deals with this internal object relations world, these six characters. Now the unconscious ego wants to project, like a, it's like he's holding a film projector. He wants to project these six characters onto others in the outside, hoping to get his own conscious ego's attention to realize the endopsychic structure. Grief is healed when it's witnessed by a caring other. So the idea is that the unconscious ego wants us and the conscious ego to be, so in other words, we are our own caring other. So these models and these quotes are helping us to become our own uh, caring witness. Grief is healed when it's witnessed by a caring other. We are our own caring other. And these models and quotes help us to, to do that, I think. Um, okay, so that's uh, uh, the theory about the first six months, the paranoid schizoid position. With enough love, the splits come together. Now, as the split images are coming together, now, remember, that can happen when the loving memories outweigh the frustrating memories. Then the split images can come together. Now we face the ambivalence with the mother. Now the baby gets that the mother is one person who's mostly loving but sometimes frustrating, and he understands that. Now we introduce some new feelings. Now he feels maybe badly if he's going to be angry at the one he loves. Now the baby gets it. If he's angry and he expresses his anger, he now gets that he's expressing his anger towards his mother, the one who loves him, the one whom he loves. So there's this ambivalence there. So from uh, six months to 36 months, that's called the depressive position. Okay, so the first phase was the paranoid schizoid position. Okay, uh, the baby thinks uh, that there's two people, that, that the mother's two people, Jekyll and Hyde. He doesn't get that Jekyll and Hyde is one person. In the fairy tale, it'd be like the, the protagonist doesn't understand that the good witch and the bad witch are really just one woman just shown in different emotional forms on the baby's point of view. So the baby, um, um, okay, so um, it, when the split images come together, the baby has this, he now faces the ambivalence. He now faces the real, the psychic reality that the mother is both loving and frustrating. That's the reality. The mother's one person, not a goddess or demon, and they're split and they're different than two people, two characters. No, the mother's one person. The baby gets that. That's the reality. Now he feels a little ambivalence. If he's going to be angry at his mother, he's going to feel a little badly about that. And he'll want to maybe even re repair that because he loves his mother and the mother loves him. So there's the genuine ambivalence there. Now that's huge, a huge accomplishment to bring both sides together like that. That's uh, uh, facing the, the reality of the ambivalence. Right. Now, during this period, that this is called, Klein calls this depressive anxiety. It's not depression, 
It's just, she uses that word depressive to convey that the child would feel kind of sad if he hurts the one he loves. That's all she means. Right? Wrong, maybe not the best choice of words, but a lot of this jargon is approximate, you know. Robert Bly says, forgive psychology for its jargon. And, uh, okay, so in the earlier stage, in the paranoid schizoid phase, the anxiety was way more severe. It was annihilation anxiety and persecutory anxiety, way more uh, fear for survival, that kind of anxiety. So the child had to dis wildly distort reality. Mother's a goddess or a demon, and that's it, and he denies. So, okay. Uh, but with enough love, the child sees reality more. Oh, the mother's one person. Now he feels a little badly if he hurts the one he loves. Whereas in the prior stage, he doesn't feel badly if he hurts the one he loves because the one, if he hurts the one uh, he loves, he's not he's not hurting his mother. He doesn't get it. You see. Okay. Uh, so let's uh, maybe add to this point here about the depressive position here. Okay. The next part here just adds to it. Clients with a fixation on hate appear to be dominated by the paranoid schizoid mode of experiencing. They lack the moderation of the depressive mode that can help them become more reflective and think about the way they are construing relationships. Okay, so in the paranoid schizoid position, he calls it here the paranoid schizoid mode of experiencing. Okay. So he, he's just paraphrasing Melanie, Melanie Klein. Melanie Klein says the paranoid position, he calls it the paranoid schizoid mode of experiencing. So that's the fixation on hate, greed, envy, spite, vindictiveness, schadenfreude, okay, a bit, and so on, right? The, the humor there is uh, put down humor and uh, lack of empathy and care and uh, exploiting. Okay, all the things we know about the narcissistic pattern, all the things we know about the bully pattern, the Iago character, you can hear their philosophies in literature. It's very negative, it's very pessimistic. Their philosophy is, what is it, sophism and nihilistic. It's all these negative philosophies are an expression of the baby's anger towards his mother. So these negative philosophies are code that when they were a baby, they were angry at the mother and, and they didn't get enough love. So that's their way of talking about how when they were a baby, how when they were a baby, they didn't get enough love. Not getting enough love then leads to the hate. Hate is not organic. First, the natural state of affairs is to receive love and he's calm. If he doesn't get the love, then he's angry. Right? So these philosophies express the anger. So he's saying here, clients fixated in this early state. Um, so clients with a fixation on hate, greed, envy, spite, they're dominated by the paranoid schizoid mode of experiencing. That's the first six months. That's the rest of development during the first six months. That means they have one of those patterns just mentioned. The narcissistic pattern, the closet, narcissistic pattern, hiding behind power struggles as a character defense, the hostile provocative style, um, uh, the, the, the Iago character one, uh, some of those, the symbiotic character disorder, and there are a few other ones, right? Okay, they lack the moderation of the depressive mode. The depressive mode means they're facing the ambivalence. They're, they're facing the, they're, they're, they understand that the mother is loving and frustrating. They can do that because the mother was loving, more loving than frustrating. So they can face the ambivalence, right? Um, and with that uh, ambivalence, they're more reflective about things. They can consider things more. Oh, mother's normally loving, or maybe she's having a, Maybe she's uh, busy, oh, but I, I think everything will be okay because mother's more loving than frustrating. So they can think about things. They're more reflective that way. Okay, they have more reflection now. In the paranoid schizoid position, they don't want to reflect. It's either or thinking, all good, all bad, all X, all Y, goddess, demon. It's, it's, it's this splitting defense mechanism. That's the baby's frantic attempt okay, to deal with the anxiety of the mother being more frustrating than loving. The baby splits like that. Right. Okay, uh, so these two quotes here, 940 and 941, add to our series of uh, quotes on the Melanie Klein's theory of the paranoid schizoid position, the use of the defense mechanism of splitting and projective identification. See, when the splitting is there, to preserve the splits, the person is going to project the one side onto non-threatening substitute others, coax the others, see the others as being negative, 
Okay, so they, in their minds, they're identifying what they're denying in themselves as belonging to someone else, and they want to coax them to play that role. That preserves the splits because they can't face the ambivalence. That's how they continue to not face the ambivalence when they keep projecting it outward. Lachlan calls this creating a mirror. The idea is that the unconscious ego is projecting outward for the conscious ego to recognize that his unconscious ego is creating a mirror for the person to see what's in, inside, what he's denying in himself. That's the psyche's attempt at healing. You know. So the psyche wants the conscious ego to cooperate with the psyche, right? Now, uh, so from birth to six months, uh, there's this ambivalence the child feels. Uh, he's he, uh, he, he he's uh, more realistic and uh, he's a little more cautious and reflective because he loves his mother and sees that his mother is frustrating sometimes. But that's okay. Now, if that continues by the age of three, the split images come together fully. Now, what's they have what's called whole object relations. The mother is seen fully uh, as a three, four dimensional human being and the child has a sense of self. This is called ontological security, basic trust and so on. And, and with whole object relating, that's the seeds for, that's the, that's the psychic structure for mutuality. If the child has ontological security, he feels safe enough to know himself. So he has access to the real self and the capacities of the real self. One of the capacities of the real self is that the person knows their unique individual wishes and if they express themselves, if they express their unique selves, Masterson says, well, that's meaningful. To, to know who you are, to express yourself, that's meaningful for the person because they're connected to themselves that way. Um, the real self allows the person appropriate affect. If the situation allows for them to be happy, they can be happy. If the, real, if the situation requires the person to mourn a loss, the real self will allow the person the necessary emotions to mourn the loss. The, the real self allows for creativity and spontaneity and uh, affectionate relationships, tender relationships, understanding of others, uh, care, you know, th so this is, um, uh, there's a wide range of affect. So guilt and remorse are available, happiness and gratitude and love are available, a whole spectrum, a wide range of emotions are available. Whereas in the paranoid schizoid position, the primary emotions are anger, greed, envy, spite, and all that, right? In the codependent pattern from six months to 36, they're caught in between. So they're the hopeless romantics. Um, so by the way, um, the technique uh, from birth, from uh, six months to 36 months, Fair Baron says, is called the hysterical technique. So the child received enough love to differentiate, but he didn't get enough love to complete the separation individuation process. So he also didn't achieve the psychological birth. So now he's hysterical. What he does is he projects the good mother onto everyone, onto, out, onto outside figures, but keeps the rejecting mother within. So he idealizes others and he berates himself. That's called a hysterical technique. So sometimes he's overly optimistic, uh, like he's unrealistically optimistic. Um, he's trying to find good mother again to complete the process. Right. So we had an earlier video about the techniques, fair variance for techniques, the paranoid technique, hysterical technique, and the other two were the phobic technique and the obsessive technique. Um, okay, maybe we'll switch gears here and talk about um, defense mechanisms. So we'll do a couple here. Each defense mechanism is a thread in this series, so these next three uh, add to them. Okay, the defense mechanism of reaction formation. Reaction formation operates to negate repressed wishes by the expression of the opposite sentiment. Okay, it's the adoption of an attitude opposite to one that produces anxiety. For example, if a mother loves and protects her child with great zeal, one can suppose that she does so because of normal love. Or it is sometimes said that she really hates and rejects the child and that her great show of love is a reaction formation. Yeah, that's a tough example there. So a person has a wish 
but he feels uh, afraid of it. He wants to stay in touch with the wish, whatever it is. So he'll talk about it by talking about it in reverse. So if the person has an unconscious wish to engage in a vice, uh, he thinks it's, but he's, he feels badly about it, he'll advertise how bad it is. But secretly he wants to do it, or at least in fantasy. So one example was the guy who wanted to smoke, and then he advertised strongly how bad smoking was, but secretly he wanted to smoke. Right? Right. You, can, you can do that with any vice. Sitcoms do this with in romance. You know, the girl likes the guy, but she's afraid to admit it. And she doesn't even really know herself, but the viewer knows that she likes him, but she doesn't know. So she openly says how much she hates the guy. That's a reaction formation. It's a counterphobia. So she's phobic about her feelings of like towards the guy. So she, to stay in touch with the like towards the guy, the way she stays in touch with it is to say it in its opposite form. So she has a link there, but she's flipping it to have access to it, right? It's hard to convey that idea. Um, um, so the example here was normally a mother loves her children. She protects them, and that's great. We know we understand that. But sometimes there are rare cases. Maybe it's very rare, but there are exceptions. Uh, there are cases where the mother maybe doesn't like the child, rejects the child, didn't want to have a child or whatever, uh, but doesn't want to admit that, doesn't want to face that, doesn't want to accept that, doesn't want to consider that. So to deal with, so she flips it. So she's overly uh, zealous about her care and attention towards the child, but she's pushy and she's demanding and she's orderly, ordering the child around and do this and do that and uh, micromanaging the child or something. Uh, that's her way to... Uh, stay in touch with her unconscious feelings of anger towards the child. That's the theory. It's called reaction formation. Again, very rare. I don't I don't think it's common, but uh, anyways. Um, um, so sometimes, uh, some, some books, some, I don't mention this, but uh, sometimes uh, the example given in the books is the preacher guy who says that short-term love relationships are very terrible uh, and he's very passionate about that um, but he secretly uh, likes it and wants it and even maybe engages in it but he doesn't want to admit it or face it or confess it so he overtly in bombastic fashion says how bad uh, the vice of short-term relationships that's the preacher guy right so a lot of preachers were uh, in, in the book they gave the example where the preacher was um, uh, was caught, let's say, and then, but everyone was surprised. But he said, oh, he said how. So, but okay. The, the idea is that about reaction formation is the person wants to stay in touch with his desire, but he feels afraid of it. So to stay in touch with this desire, whatever it is, he expresses his wish by speaking in its flip form, in its opposite form. That gives him a, a thread, a link to it. So he's vicariously staying in touch with his wish by talking about it in its opposite form, right? So sometimes someone has strong, exaggerated opinions in one way. That may be a reaction formation. He may be seeing that he secretly has the unconscious fantasy wish of doing what he's saying he's against. That's called reaction formation. Okay, the next uh, defense mechanism is uh, rationalization. Rationalization is not a process of logical reasoning, but an attempt to make conduct appear sensible. Irrationalization perhaps would be a more appropriate term. When you rationalize, you give, quote, good reasons that serve to conceal from yourself and from other people the real reasons. Rationalization serves to protect the ego against the necessity of acknowledging the real desires underlying the behavior. Neurotics often tend to evade insight into their motives by focusing attention on their, their situation, which to them appear to justify their actions, and then they're engaged in a verbal shell game. 
So I thought we would add this uh, metaphor here. One, one person calls rationalization a verbal shell game. So he's lying. So rationalizations are used to help the person not be aware that they're using a defense mechanism. If they become aware that they're using a defense mechanism, it may lead to them becoming aware of why they're using that defense mechanism. So they use a rationalization to not be aware of both the unconscious emotional conflict, the defense against the anxiety of it, and they want to hide both of it by using a rationalization. So Burglar says, and other people say as well, first they face the rationalizations, then they notice the defense mechanisms, then they notice the unconscious conflict underneath it. So these rationalizations, there are so many ways to formulate these rationalizations, false logic, Superficial logic, uh, you can get a book on logical fallacies, they're all rationalizations. Um, so you're, you're basically you're lying, you want to convince yourself, you want to believe your own lie, you want others to believe the lie. The best way to tell a lie is to include a few crumbs of truth, right? or it confuses people. In, last, in the last video, uh, one was called uh, footnoting, where you use uh, generalizations but then you bog it down with technicalities so you want to confuse the issue uh, and then um, the idea is uh, with referencing you you want to appeal to people's sense of authority um, so that's the, that's one of the logical fallacies appeal to authority um, so a person wants to sound authoritative to make you believe the lie kind of thing right? there's straw man argument red herring uh, there's transfer, there's uh, appeal to your unconscious wishes, there's uh, circular reasoning, equivocation, lots of equivocation, double think, double speak, double talk, all this, uh, all this way to, uh, you know, if you glance through any book on propaganda, that's all rationalizations, right, to, to lie, you know, to add man, you know. So we're adding one more aspect to rationalization. He calls it a verbal shell game. Interesting phrase there. Right? Again, rationalization is not a process of logical reasoning, but he wants you to think it's a process of logical reasoning. But it's not. But he wants you to think it is. That's how he's selling the lie to himself and to others. So for example, in the paranoid schizoid position, he doesn't want to face the unconscious ambivalence with the mother. He doesn't want to face that when he was a baby his mother was more frustrating than loving okay so he has a he has these condensed memories of the mother's being frustrating and he's still there that, that bothers him doesn't want to face that ambivalence okay so he'll project it onto a non-threatening substitute other okay uh, and then he wants to convince himself that this non-threatening substitute other is the bad person now how does he lie to himself to do that he may coax the other to do something bad then he'll use a rationalization say see so he'll overgeneralize. He'll use uh, one little thing and then overgeneralize. Use a glittering generality about something to, to lie to himself about it. Um, so he he's uh, not, he doesn't want to face the unconscious ambivalence uh, with the mother. So he's he's using these defense mechanisms to preserve the splits, to preserve the loyalty to the rejecting mother because he's not ready to leave the mother. He didn't get enough to leave the mother. He didn't get enough love to leave the mother, so he's still loyal there. He's afraid to get the key out from under mother's pillow. Okay, to avoid the fear of that issue, he'll project the rejecting mother onto non-threatening substitute to others and use some rationalization, some, some lie basically, a long lie, superficial logic, fake logic, uh, verbal shell game, uh, to convince himself and others that this non-threatening substitute other is the bad mother. And that allows him to continue to not face the truth that when they were a baby, the mother was more frustrating than loving. But when he does that, he continues to deny that he has unconscious ambivalence. When he continues to deny that he's still using the infantile baby mechanism of splitting. He continues to deny the psychic structure of the paranoid schizoid position. Right? So that means uh, he, he's avoiding uh, healing himself. Man's main task is to give psychological birth to himself. If he didn't get it by the age of three, man's main task is to do it himself. Right. 
That's the moral revolution, taking responsibility for our inner child, taking responsibility for ourselves, right? and, and so on. Um, someone said it's having moral, moral courage to uh, engage the, in the process of healing ourselves. Joseph Campbell calls it the hero's journey, to, uh, to observe the endopsychic structure, to own our projections, we have a strong negative opinion about someone else, that's a confession of the unconscious ambivalence and anger towards the mother. So projection is confession, prejudice is confession of the splitting defense mechanism, and so on. Okay, so rationalizations are there to hide the use of defense mechanisms. Defense mechanisms are there to hide the unconscious psychic pain. Okay, one more here, projection. A person who employs the mechanism of projection perceives in other people the motives and, tra and traits about which he is sensitive and anxious and anxious himself. So that's one way of putting it. So that's another thread in this series. Uh, um, the, the defense mechanism of projection, something you don't know about yourself. And suddenly you find yourself out of unconscious fantasy suddenly saying that this other person possesses this trait or feeling or that attitude or so on. So he's saying here this happens when a person is anxious and sensitive about this motive or trait within himself. Okay? So again, projection is a defense against anxiety. He doesn't want to face the anxiety about something, about his memories, about the open wound, attitudes around it, thoughts around it feelings around it, um, opinions around it. So he'll just say, oh, that other person, such and such. Yeah. Okay, another thread in this series, another uh, thread in this series is the topic of anxiety. So we'll just add one more idea around that. Phobia as displaced anxiety. In a sense, two learning processes take place. First, a fear conditioning, and second, the further substitution of a new stimulus for the original one. Okay, so a few of the quotes on anxiety up to this point so far. Uh, one of them is Masterson's uh, axiom, self-activation leads to anxiety, which leads to defense. Meaning if a person wants to do something from the real self, that triggers memories of how when they were a baby, the child's wishes got refused, so that brings up anxiety. And then there's, then a person uses a defense mechanism to deal with the anxiety. Self-activation self triggers massive anxiety, which then triggers the use of a defense mechanism. That's Masterson's model. A burglar has one. He says anxiety is when you don't square accounts with the superego. So his theory is that the baby has a wish for love, it gets refused, steps one and two. Okay, again, the baby has a wish for mother's love, that's step one. The mother says no, step two, it got rejected. Step three, the baby wants to protest, but he doesn't have the motor skills, that's step three. Step four, the child feels uh, defeated somehow. Now let's call the memory of these four steps, for simplicity, for, uh, out of simplicity, let's just call this the superego being the one that remembers this. Now, in the repetition compulsion, the person as adult wants to self-activate. He has a wish from his real self. The superego says no. So that's steps one and two. But now the person's an adult. He's going to protest. The superego says, well, what are you protesting? Well, mother didn't give me the love, so I'm going to protest. Yeah, but you're not a baby. You're an adult. That's happened decades ago. Who are you protesting against? What are you protesting? Well, uh, uh, I guess I'll uh, just fantasize that something in the outside world represents my mother and I'll be protest them in some form. The superego says, really? Well, uh, well, it's a, it's a fake protest. It's a pseudo-aggression. It's a pseudo-protest. Uh, but uh, okay, if that's what you're going to do, uh, I'll let you do that. Uh, and that's how you deal with uh, not facing the truth. Okay. Now, if the person at one point switches from pseudo-aggression 
or being dysfunctional, in other words, being dysfunctional is pseudo-aggression. Now, if the person wants to stop doing that and he wants to begin to heal, he didn't square accounts with the superego. The superego said that was the deal. Now, the person wants to break the deal with the superego. He wants to heal. Superego says, well, what are you talking about? We're caught in the repetition compulsion of, of uh, what happened in babyhood time. You can't just magically snap your fingers and say you're healed. So the superego says, fine, you want to change this, you're going to feel anxiety. So the person says, okay, I'll feel the anxiety. So anxiety is when you... Uh, consider that the person has a, an insecure acquired an insecure attachment style with the mother that prevented them from self-activation. So to go back there and to forgive the mother, that's going to bring up some of the memories and the anxiety is going to be around that. Another person said anxiety very simply is memories of mother abandoning you or thinking that the mother was going to abandon you or the memory of uh, mother punishing you. So remember, anxiety is something you don't know. It's an, it's an internal fear, and you don't know what that fear is. It's internal. So anxiety comes from this internal memory, unconscious memory. Right. So here we're adding one more. This one, I guess, is more of a behavioral one. You know? So the baby has a conditioned fear about something. Now this uh, trigger gets associated with another thing. Now this other thing maybe takes different forms. So the phobia is displaced onto other things. Now the child is anxious about these other things and he's not making the connection that these other things are a reminder of his unconscious or memory of his original phobic trigger. Something like that. Okay, so maybe we'll follow up on that one next time. Okay, let's uh, move on to uh, duplicity. Yeah. Okay, as it develops in the child, human language stems from self-expression and imitation of the language of adults. These two roots of language are responsible for the duplicity of human communication. Helmut Kaiser describes this duplicity as the universal symptom of all psychoneuroses, inasmuch as the conflict between self-love and self-expression and love of others cannot be solved by the client. So what he's saying, I think, is the baby wanted to express himself, had a need. Uh, the mother rejected it. Okay, now the child is learning language in the process of all this time. He's learning language. So in the repetition compulsion, when he's speaking, it's reflecting this conflict this original conflict. So the child is confused, he has a need, he's afraid, so he's, his speech is kind of, so he's saying that's duplicity. He can't say what he really, there's a, a, shell, a verbal shell game or something, or he encrypts the truth. Because the baby's, the person's afraid, the person's operating from the template or the script from babyhood time of the baby being afraid to express his wishes and needs. Now as an adult, he's afraid to speak his real feelings and wishes and needs, and real situation, because that relates to the pain of the relationship with the mother. Now that's being projected into the present. So uh, Kaiser has this idea, his, his mindset is that uh, the moment he has a client, that's all he focuses on. Let's just focus on this duplicity aspect. Let's just uh, um, help the person to say what he means and that kind of thing. That's the idea about that. Okay, uh, here's the quote about the, the open wound. Okay, the disturbance which seems inexplicable in the mind of the client is always found in his or her actions. The current emotion repeats an unconscious childhood emotion. This is an open wound. Maybe we can call it a phantasm. So he's introducing the jargon of a phantasm. A phantasm is the open wound of a childhood trauma. So in the repetition compulsion, the emotions in the present are a repetition of the unconscious emotions from childhood, which are an open wound, you see. And, and this open wound, this open wound or phantasm is what motivates 
It's, it's why the repetition compulsion is taking place, because it's an open wound. The person wants to heal. The psyche seeks healing. It's painful. So he wants to heal this old childhood wound. So that's why there's repetition compulsion. Okay, we'll do two more here. This next one's on uh, transference. The client unconsciously attempts to manipulate the therapeutic situation in the way in which he has experienced his infantile neuroses. It is the task of the therapist to understand the development of and the reasons for the client's predetermined fixed reactions and to help him not only to understand but to experience emotionally the inadequateness of these old reactions. Okay, so that's the repetition compulsion. Right, so the the so the baby and the mother that's a dyad. Now in the therapy room, that sort of resembles that. There's the the therapist who's sort of like a parental-ish like figure, and the client is now uh, himself in pain. So it kind of it's going to bring up this childhood situation with the mother mother baby dyad. It's going to relive itself somehow in the client therapy situation. So he's saying here, the client is going to coax the therapist to play the role of the frustrating parent. That's the repetition compulsion. So it's called transference. He's going to transfer the frustrating parent onto the therapist. It is the task of the therapist to understand the development and the reasons for the client's predetermined fixed reactions and to help him not only to understand, but to experience emotionally the repetition compulsion gone awry. So he has to get that he's repeating a childhood situation and it's no longer appropriate in the present. So if he interprets all this, he can under, he's building his understanding. He, he can be a witness to himself. So the therapist is now the caring witness. Grief is healed when it's witnessed by a caring other. So in this case, when the therapist offers an, a transference interpretation, um, he's being the caring witness. Okay, uh, this quote... One last quote here. Okay, as analysis proceeds, the client no longer responds to the analyst as a real and present person, but as the fantasy of an important figure from his childhood. The transference must therefore be dissolved by interpreting it to the client. When he understands that he responded to the analyst not as a real person but as a surrogate for a parental fixation, the transference will end. In terms of psychoanalytic dynamics, the life force is transferred from the parent imago of the... Okay, again. Uh, the life force is transferred from the parent imago to the new object, the analyst, who then gives it back to the client. The life force so transferred cannot return to its infantile love objects and so is at the disposal of the ego for dealing with reality. The neurotic condition is thereby cured. The psychoanalytic method of treatment is based on the theory that the neurotic suffers from a weakness of internal energy that prevents him from using the superior methods of dealing with what has been repressed, i.e., all that's in the unconscious. His lack of strength is due to the fixation of the life force on infantile love, love objects and to the concern of the ego with infantile anxieties. The aims of treatment are therefore to free the life force from its fixations and to strengthen the ego, thus making the client capable of dealing with his problems. I, I, at this quote, I feel like I tried to summarize the whole thing in a way. I tried to summarize the problem and the solution. So, I remember what Fairbairn said, the more frustrating the mother is, the more the baby needs the, the mother, the more the baby is going to attach to the mother. That means much more of the child's life force is going to cathect to this rejecting image of the mother, this imago. So, so much of his life force, his vitality, his, his energy, is, goes into this image of the frustrating mother. And he's tired by that. Okay, so he doesn't have energy for present living because he's, 
in this unconscious uh, stressful situation. So Robert Bly says, get the key out from under mother's pillow. He means decathect from the rejecting image of the frustrating mother and transfer that energy to an object that supports the person's development. Okay, so in that video, uh, in that cartoon video from two days ago, uh, there was a character, Freddy, he had a new therapist who supports him. So now Freddy forms a bond to the therapist. Now his life force is going to, in his unconscious, will cathect to the image of the therapist. So he's decathecting from the rejecting mother and attaching to a supporting other. Okay. So that's the goal of therapy. That's, that's what he's saying. All right. And again, about transference, uh, he understands that uh, the therapist is a surrogate for a parental fixation. If he understands that the therapist is being used as a due to the fixation um, to the rejecting image of the mother and he's projecting that rejecting image of the mother or father onto the therapist if he understands that uh, that can help that can help a lot right? that can help a lot to get the key out from under mother's pillow okay so I'll just uh, all of these quotes are posted below um, I think I think they add to all of our previous material and, um, Okay, uh, you know, I think I found the theme song for this series. It's the German cover version of Windmills of the Mind, sung by Katja Epstein. Okay, so thank you very much. This has been TQ 940 to 946. Okay, so we covered a little bit more about Melanie Klein's theory of the paranoid schizoid position. This position is based on the child being fixated in the ongoing use of the defense mechanism of splitting where he denies one side and rejects that there's an unconscious ambivalence with the mother. Okay, so this is a huge distortion of reality. If the fixation is there, Burglar calls that a rejection at the fixation level of not getting enough love to differentiate from the love from the mother. To differentiate from the mother, the split images have to come together. But splitting prevents that. And a lot of patterns come from this fixation. The narcissistic pattern, the closet narcissistic pattern, the hostile provocative attachment style, hiding behind power struggles as a character defense, the schizoid pattern, the one that resembles the Iago character from literature, and some of those symbiotic character disorders, so we'll have more on that hopefully in the future, and other patterns. With enough love, the baby understands that the mother is one person, not two, one person, the same person who's mostly loving but sometimes frustrating, thus facing the unconscious ambivalence, the child can now accept the ambivalence with the mother. He can accept the ambivalence with the mother, whereas in prior, whereas in prior cases, the, the child cannot accept the ambivalence with the mother, so he's still using a defense mechanism of splitting. That's a huge, a huge, interesting theory here. Um, so when the child faces the ambivalence, 
when the child is able to face the ambivalence with the mother, he, he now can feel badly for hurting the one he loves. Um, so things are more realistic. Um, he's moving towards a psychological birth because when the splits come together at the age of three, he can fully differentiate and achieve the psychological birth. So again, biological birth and psychological birth are different things. Great song, huh? So biological birth is a visible event, we, we, we can see it. Psychological birth is an invisible event, it happens internally and it's gradual. First there's the stage of symbiosis from birth to six months, this is the, like, a, like an egg. At six months the child hatches out of the egg, that's called the stage of differentiation. But this is a gradual process, after differentiation is the practicing subphase. In the second year of life, that's the rapprochement subphase, and at the age of three, when the hippocampus comes online, and the hippocampus can record, can recognize that the baby received lots of love and support during the past three years, the brain gives the child a feeling of basic trust, ontological security, a sense of self. That's called the psychological birth. Now the person can have access to the real self and know his uniqueness. From 6 months to 36 months, during this ambivalence period, this is the time when the person can think about things. This supports reflection. The paranoid schizoid pos position, they don't want to reflect, they don't want to question, they don't want to read a psychology, they don't, you know, they don't want to reflect because they're too caught in they're too invested in the anger at the mother and they're too stuck and they're too much stuck using the defense mechanism of splitting everything's either all good or all bad right it's either black or white or this all good this all bad idealization or devaluation they see things pretty much in that way um, there's a very, prejudice comes from there. There's a very strong sort of in-group, out-group mentality. Um, but in the depressive position, there's more reflection about relationships. The baby has that experiencing of think, that the baby has that experience of thinking, oh yeah, the mother's mostly good, sometimes frustrating, okay. So the baby is able to think about things. So the ability to reflect begins during the depressive position. The depressive position is linked to depressive anxiety because the baby doesn't feels badly if he hurts the one he loves. But in the prior stage, okay, the anxiety is much more great, so the person doesn't want to think about things. It's either all good or all bad and keeps it overly simple like that. Okay, we, we updated, so we added some more quotes on The singers Katja Epstein from Germany. She does a great job on this song. Not many, not many singers do a. I think this is a hard song to sing. I think Epstein, uh, Katja Epstein did it. Yeah. Another good rendition of this song is Barbara Lewis. That's a very good rendition. Katja Epstein and Barbara Lewis, I think, are, are my two favorite renditions of Windmills of the Mind. Okay, we also uh, added a little bit more about rationalization. Uh, one author calls it a verbal shell game. Lying to yourself. Okay. So, rationalization is also an attempt to deal with anxiety. The anxiety of becoming aware that the person is using a defense mechanism. And the defense mechanism is being used itself to deal with the anxiety of, of an unconscious ambivalence with the mother that they don't want to face. It's too painful. So it has this layered quality to it. 
So that's the theory of the onion. You feel the layers of the onion there. One on projection. If you're sensitive about something or anxious about something yourself, you say it belongs to other people. Okay, the one about phobia as displaced anxiety. Okay, the Kaiser's idea about duplicity. He says the, the main thing to focus on is helping people to speak straight. Like to help people, it's difficult. You know? Because it brings up the memories. The child couldn't express his wish. Look what happened, he, felt, he feels pain about it. So it's hard to speak straight in the present sometimes. It brings up the memories of the past. Speaking honestly and straightly in the present, that's self-activation. Self-activation triggers anxiety. Self-activation breaks the deal with the superego. You know? The superego is the memory of what happened in childhood. Okay, the idea of uh, the open wound or phantasm as being the reason why repetition compulsion takes place. Okay, to, uh, one about the, the transference. Okay, the client tries to recreate, relive, manufacture, redo, remake the childhood situation in the present with the therapist. Because he's trying to communicate to himself and the therapist what his childhood was like. He's showing the therapist what his childhood was, was like by how he's behaving in the present. Right? And the last one here was sort of a, a kind of a summary statement about the therapy process. Okay, the therapist is a parental substitute surrogate. If you can realize that, that's a big help. And the idea that too much of the life force is connected to the rejecting image of the mother. And you want to you want to get the key from out from under mother's pillow. And your life force, you want your life force to be attached to an internal object of a memory of, of somebody who supports your uh, yourself. You know. Okay, so I'll leave it here. So thank you very much. This has been TQ. 94960. The quotes are posted below. I hope some of this has been informative and helpful. We'll add to it all. We'll add to these in future videos. Thanks again. Bye for now.